Well, hello, it's me, Mick Scarlett here again with part three of my Beginner's Guide to All Things Disability. Um, part one was all about the social model of disability and why that matters. Part two was explaining just a few things about language and disability. Both of those have been quite well received, but I've had some people say, oh, it's all PC madness. The world's gone mad, um, which in itself is slightly offensive to people who have mental health issues. But let's actually delve into why it matters. Why is it PC madness? Well, it isn't. Uh, one, I've never really understood why people are so offended at the idea of being politically correct or why not using language or talking about someone in a way that hurts them is, oh, is silly. Why would you want to do that? Um, when I was at school, um, one of my friends, uh, Tony Healy, um, had the thinnest skin of any child I'd ever met. Um, and honestly, kids could bully him by calling him Healy. And he would go, you know, really get really upset. And he, um, he, he sort of taught me that actually it's not what we, what I think is a term that upsets someone that I think I should use. It's what the people think. If you call me, you know, something that I don't like, then surely I should say, actually, that's really hurtful. Could you not call me that? And that's kind of what the, la well, the language thing matters. Um, and I used to be someone that said things like, oh, call me what you like, just give me the job. And that's fine. But actually calling me a name that demeans me or belittles me or disempowers me means I'm less likely to get the job. And it also means that the person that's employing me doesn't understand me anyway. So they're probably not the kind of person to work for. So it is important. But more importantly, the social model, language, the way society sees you, shapes the way you feel when you are disabled. Now, I'm weird. I was born with cancer, which left me with a paralysed right leg. So I was always disabled. It took me, to, it took me until I was five and a bit to learn to walk um, properly. Um, and uh, even then, I, ran, I walked with a limp. I couldn't run very fast. But I managed to go to a mainstream school. And when I got there... I, had, I was the only disabled kid, and I was the only disabled kid at, six, at, at, at senior school, sixth form, art college. I always was the first, and I was always having to prove myself. I also always got bullied, and I also kind of began trying to overcompensate, trying to be better than everyone else. And then at 15, my spine collapsed uh, because of the treatment I had for the cancer, an unknown side effect, and I became a wheelchair user. So suddenly... Overnight, I went from walking pretty all right, bit bad, bit limpy, Ian Jury, I walked a bit like him, a bit better actually. And suddenly, that's it, never walk again, all things went wrong, body broke, all, everything was very bad. And for two years, I was really, really ill, and it didn't look like I'd make it. Um, but even when I did make it, I, I brought with me all that baggage that being a wheelchair user brings with you. Society teaches you that your life's over, and I thought that. And I slowly rebuilt my life, and I slowly realised it was rubbish. But I still took all the other baggage that I've got from when I was growing up. And I'll give you two examples of things that people say to you as a disabled child, but deeply impact on how you feel. Um, one, when I was quite young, I was about five, my parents moved from uh, the first house they'd bought together, and they loved, to a bungalow. And they did that because they wanted to make sure that as I grew up, I'd be all right. So... Um, they moved, they loved it, but everyone kept telling me, your mum had to move from her lovely little house that she loved to this bungalow. And that's all because of you, you know, she did that for you. So that way of being told it's all because of you, um, really cut. And I thought my poor mum had to leave her a lovely house that she loved, that I kind of vaguely remembered. And you know, I remember seeing Captain Scarlet on the telly and eating Kit Kat, um, and uh, that cut. It was my fault. But worse than that, when I was seven, my father died of a heart attack. And almost from the moment he died, everyone said to me, not my mum, but everyone else said to me, you know what that was? That was having you, that was. Having you broke his heart. All the stress of having you, oh, that's what killed him. So I grew up genuinely thinking I'd killed my dad. And those are the kind of things you get because everyone says, well, I don't care what my baby is as long as they're healthy. So when you're not healthy, 
your thought. You think of yourself as, oh, I'm the booby prize. I'm the one that, I'm the mistake. I'm the thing that no one really wants. And that is what society tells you if you're disabled. If you become disabled, then that's even more of a head. <laughs> because what you do is you're, you've got all the stereotypes that you've been brought up as a non-disabled person. And then you're coping with learning with your new body and how ill it is and what it does. And, and it, you know, you don't know that it's going to settle down and you're suddenly going to get used to it. And then suddenly you might start rebuilding your life. All you know is what's the, what the media and society tells you, that your life is over and probably you're better off dead. And that's why it matters. It isn't political correctness gone mad. It's because whether you're a disabled child growing up or you're a newly disabled person and you're suddenly learning what it's going to be like, Living in a world where people actually give a toss and think about what words they use and think about how they think about you and think about what they say to people means that you haven't got to wade through all of that rubbish to hopefully come out the other end. You've just got to learn to cope with being the new you or being the you you were born with and, and, and shining and showing what you can do. Why aren't there more disabled people on the, in the media? Um, because... You know, it, oh, we're going to get 5%. 22% of the population are disabled. So 5% is nothing. It's currently at three, isn't it, I think? And it's sort of, you know, that in itself is one of the reasons why the social model matters. Because we've got to stop thinking about us as broken dolls. We aren't. We are important, vibrant people. We matter to society. We bring something to the table. For example... I live with chronic pain, right? I have a uh, chronic neuralgic pain that just eats at me all day, every day. And so many people refuse to believe it because I'm so positive and I'm up and I'm chipper, right? And that's because I've learned over 38 years since I first developed it, how to cope. Do I ever get asked to help anyone with pain, how to cope? No, I don't. Because I'm disabled, what do I know? It's all about doctors and specialists. This is what I mean. We bring something new. So. It's really important. I won't waffle on anymore. Uh, there will be more to follow, I am sure. There's no escape for me from this. You've had it, listeners. You've had it, you're, you're, I'm just going to keep waffling forever. But there you go. It's not PC uh, stuff gone mad. It's actually a really important method of how to change the way you feel about a really large minority in our society. Bye. Where was it about?